I'm Harville Hendricks, and uh, my occupation is that I help couples with their relationships. I'm a couples therapist. I work with couples, and the training is training um, therapists who are already uh, credentialed with their license and their and permission to practice in their state in how to how to relate to a couple clinically or therapeutically. And fundamentally, the, the training for them is to help the therapist understand that the couple um, is fundamentally in conflict for one, one really chronic reason all across couples. That is that their, ch- their childhood has been transferred into their marriage. They don't do it consciously. It's like, it's just what happens. It, you grew up with the family. That family shapes your experience with them. That experience with them creates an image in your mind about the primary people in your life. And then when you become an adult and you go on your search and find mission, the, the falling in love experience, you uh, see somebody across a crowded room and you move toward them like a moth to the flame. And you, you, know, you feel all these wonderful things called romantic love and they are your dream person. You do not know that there's a program running in, out of your awareness in the background that's matching you with somebody similar to the caretakers with whom you grew up and matching you particularly with a person with whom you will experience the worst frustrations, the worst frustrations, not the best experiences that you had with your caretakers. And so then, while they look like the person of your dreams, they will become the person of your nightmares. And <clears throat> that leads then into the power struggle. And that's when couples come to therapists. And so most therapists for generations have tried to help couples talk better, have better communication, do problem-solving negotiation, conflict resolution. It doesn't work because that's a very cognitive and behavioral sort of interaction. Um, and therapists have not known for un, until we sort of got it out there that what they had to do was help couples understand that particular reality, that their romantic attraction was based upon an unconscious image that brought them together, and that apparently this is the way nature works. It brings together people who are incompatible, who think that they are compatible, but they're fundamentally incompatible, Uh, for mutual healing and growth because what we discovered in our research over the years is that if I fall in love with somebody, I'm falling in love with the person who's going to activate the parts of me that need to grow the most so that it becomes a mutual growth and mutual healing process and therapists need to understand that. So we teach them about that and then we teach them a relational technology that helps couples understanding that then move into altering the quality of their interactions with each other so that what we've finally been able to do is to summarize it so that the relationship becomes safe. If the relationship isn't safe, nothing can happen in the relationship because you'll go into your defenses. And that means you go into the self-protective mode you learned in childhood. And so you'll be stopped again. So you have to learn how to create safety in the relationship. The, The safety is important for the connection. If you don't have safety, you won't get connection. Connection is important because that's who we are. We are connecting beings. It's not, that's not a feeling. Connecting is reality. You can feel it. It's like <clears throat> this, is, this glass is not a feeling, but I can feel it. Connection is not a feeling. It's a reality that I can feel. <clears throat> so how that connects with um, health and wellness is that if you are not experiencing connection, you're experiencing anxiety. And when you're experiencing anxiety, you will go into defenses. And then all of the relational symptoms that produce conflict in relationships happen. But also, um, it's now become very clear in the past 20 years of relational research that there's an interface between physical health and relational health, and that the interface is very simple. If I'm in stress because of anxiety, I'm going to produce negative toxic chemicals in my bloodstream uh, <clears throat> called cortisol, and that cortisol is going to impact my immune system. I'm therefore going to be more susceptible to diseases, will have more physical symptoms, will have probably, and those will turn into emotional symptoms. 
So if I'm connected and that connection is stable, I'm living in a safe environment, a reversal sort of occurs in which you, your um, neurochemistry is still impacted, but this time it's endorphins and other called the pleasure chemicals, a whole list of them that we don't need to go into. And when you're generating that, you're doing that in a context. It's not that your body does it and then you feel better in the relationship. So you make the relationship safe in your body, produces the uh, neurochemistry. And then your immune system is uh, robust, your disease level goes down, your symptom level goes down, your longevity increases, your sense of well-being increases, your <clears throat> addictions about certain foods decreases, and because you're not wanting something all the time. I think that one of the fundamental things that I've come to understand is human beings are hungry. And, and so they will eat anything that satisfies that hunger. And food is one of the things they do, but they'll also eat drugs and they'll also uh, jump off of high, tall buildings with a rope on them. They'll do anything to stimulate something that's, called, that, that's pleasurable and joyful. And part of that, um, uh, not, not all risky sports are pathological, but, but they can be. Uh, so part of that is to satisfy hunger. And the hunger is for connection. And when that connection is stable, predictable, reliable, then you have an enormous sense of well-being. Everything works. And when the connection isn't stable, then uh, nothing works because your whole system goes into trying to get that connection back. Research has found that engaging in creative activities such as music, visual arts, movement, or creative writing actually has the ability to reduce stress and depression and therefore mitigate chronic disease. For example, listening to music has been shown to decrease anxiety, restore emotional balance, and in some cases, even abolish pain. 